Loving can hurt. Loving can hurt sometimes. But it's the only thing that I know. When it gets hard, you know it can get hard sometimes. It is the only thing that makes us feel alive. We keep this love in a photograph. We make these memories for ourselves. Where our eyes are never closing, our hearts are never broken, and time's forever frozen still. So you can keep me inside the pocket of your ripped jeans, holding me closer till our eyes meet. And you won't ever be. I haven't actually watched it. Oh, yes. Hello everyone, I'm back in my original studio, which is very exciting, but only for once, because this is the last evolutionary video I'm going to do for you guys. Oh, out of present, you're going to rip, we're going to have loads of fun today. We're going to go over the last two topics of human evolution, and we're going to be applying some evolutionary theory to see why they exist. So, the first topic we're going to be talking about today is homosexuality. Right, so, broad question for you. Why does homosexuality exist? What's the point? Because if we think back to our first video, we talked about um, what fitness meant from an evolutionary biologist perspective, and we learned that it was the ability to um, reproduce and produce viable offspring. Well, homosexuals tend to not reproduce, so therefore they have low evolutionary fitness, we can say. So what's the point? Now, we're going to be talking about that later in the video, but first we're going to be talking about how, um, what causes homosexuality. Now, the general consensus nowadays is that it has a genetic basis, um, but also the environment does play a part as well, such as um, development in the uterus has been shown to have an effect on sexual orientation. Um, but a good example of why it has a genetic basis is when you look at dizygotic twins, identical twins. Um, it's been shown that you're more likely to be gay if your identical twin is gay. So, basically, the more closely related you are to your siblings, the more likely you are to have the same sexual orientation. But, as we're going to see, it's very complex. The genetic basis and the environment interact with each other in quite a complex way. So, to the point that we're still not really sure what causes homosexuality. Now you can really see how much we've advanced as a society in recent years when you think that being gay only became legal in 1967 and it was only removed from a list of mental disorders in 1973. Nowadays, well hopefully, you can look at that and think how ridiculous because this is such a natural process that it is absolutely ridiculous to think that this was classed as a mental disorder. But anyway, that was the past. Let's stick in the present, shall we? Everything's happy now. Way! But talking about the brain, there have actually been studies comparing um, the sizes of different parts of the brain in homosexuals and heterosexuals, and they found um, some drastic differences. When looking at a specific region of the hypothalamus, which controls sexual drive and function, it was shown to be larger in homosexuals than in heterosexuals. And also when you look at the symmetry of the amygdala, which is thought to control and um, play a part in emotions, etc., um, you see the same kind of symmetry in homosexual men and heterosexual women, and vice versa, so heterosexual men and homosexual women. So depending who you're attracted to depends on the shape of this amygdala. But obviously, at the end of the day, the things that cause these changes in shapes of the brain, it all narrows down to genetics. And one of the most famous scientists um, involved in um, looking at the genetic basis of homosexuality was Harmer and his colleagues. And they suggested that um, homosexuality was um, related, was sex-linked 
So it was on the X chromosome, the genes that um, relate to homosexuality. Now his main focus was male homosexuality, and what he did, he looked at family trees and he noticed that there was a correlation of homosexuality, male homosexuality, of families on the maternal side of the family history. Now, obviously, if you're a male, you get your X chromosome from your mother. So therefore, male homosexuality is likely to be determined on that X chromosome, so on the from, from the chromosome that was given to you from your maternal side. And after loads and loads of analysis, they narrowed it down to this XQ28 region. This is a selection of genetic markers which are found to be related in homosexual men. Now, these regions are more likely, it was shown, these regions are more likely to be conserved within homosexual brothers, so where both brothers are homosexual, than what could be achieved by chance. And the opposite is true. If one brother is homosexual but the other is heterosexual, then not many of these XQ28 um, genes are conserved in both offspring than what could be achieved by chance. Because this isn't just one gene, this is a selection of different genes, all on the X chromosome. Yeah? Did I explain that right? So if you have two homosexual brothers, those two homosexual brothers share more of the alleles on, these X, on this XQ28 region than what could just happen by chance. So that's a good indicator that these genes do have an effect on your sexual orientation. However, this study wasn't actually replicated in Canada, which worked on a larger sample size. However, the study did agree that homosexuality did have a genetic basis, and in the 2005 genome wide study, it was found they, they found genes not on the sex chromosomes, but on chromosomes 7, 8 and 10. These genes were highly conserved between gay brothers. Now, in the recent 2015 genome-wide study, they found that, yes, chromosome 8 came up again, but also the XQ28 region. So basically, the overall conclusion is that there isn't one single gay gene, which is pretty obvious, I think. Otherwise, I mean, your sexual orientation is quite a big, you know, complex thing. So it being controlled by one gene would be quite surprising, don't you think? So it's likely to be a mix of different things, X-linked genes and autosomal genes. Um, and it's quite a good thing that there isn't just one gay gene, because if you... Um, well, in my course, in the molecular, I didn't actually do a video on this, but we looked at CRISPR-Cas9 technology, where you can mutate genes and produce, like, designer babies and all kind of weird stuff. Then, if it, homosexuality was only controlled by one gene, then you could make your baby gay or not gay, which is bloody ridiculous. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's not controlled by one gene. We're now moving on to why homosexuality exists. And there are three main theories, really. The first one is kin selection. Now, you've probably heard of kin selection before, and it basically speaks for itself. So the theory is that homosexual men, most of the studies, by the way, have been done on homosexual men. It's thought that um, homosexual men may help the family, the rest of the family, raise other kin, other than instead of reproducing themselves. Because by improving the fitness of your relatives, then you're indirectly increasing the chances of your genes, because you're related, so you've got similar genes, being passed on to future generations. So basically acting like kind of a nanny. Now, that may not be as useful nowadays, but you've got to put your evolutionary biology hats on and think back to a hunter-gatherer society that may have been quite useful. Now, our second theory is over-dominance, and it's all based on a heterozygote advantage. <clears throat> now, we talked about heterozygote advantage in the first video when looking at all that malaria and sickle cell anemia nonsense. But um, in this context, if we have a genotype which is heterozygous and is really useful, so significantly increases our chances of survival, that means that um, genotype is likely to be highly conserved. And the theory is, that's great, but when you're homozygous, that is when you're actually gay, homosexual. Now, if this theory is true, we'd expect the genes which influence homosexuality to be on the autosomal chromosome, so not the X, not the sex-linked chromosomes. 
because otherwise it could only happen in males and not females. But that brings us on to our next theory, which is sexually antagonistic selection, which does um, point, um, supports this XQ28 region on determining homosexuality. So this is where gay alleles are costly when they're expressed in men, because that's when you're actually gay. But in females, they present a huge fitness advantage. So once again, just like the overdominance theory, they're highly conserved within um, populations. And this has actually been supported. In 2004, a study showed that um, maternal relatives of homosexuals had greater reproductive success than maternal relatives of heterosexuals, therefore proving this sexually antagonistic theory. But to round it all off, this is all very complex. It may just not be one theory, it could be a mixture of both of these, or even all three of these. And remember, the environment also plays a massive role as well. So homosexuality has loads of things controlling it. Right, that's homosexuality. Now it's time for the last topic in this holy region of biology series. God, oh, I'm so pumped for this. It's the menopause. Now you may know, or may not know, that women only end their reproductive career before they end their lifespan. Why is that? It's not quite the case in men, is it? When you look at people like Rod Stewart and um, Des O'Connor, they've actually had children at quite an old age where, you know, the same age woman would have already been in the menopause, so being unable to reproduce. So, why does this occur? Now, we're going to be discussing whether this is adaptive or maladaptive. Now, this thing about ending your reproductive career before you end your lifespan is more seen in humans than in any other of the primates. And when talking about the maladaptive theory, it could be due to how we've evolved so quickly in such, evolutionary speaking, such a short space of time. It could be that our much more sheltered and adaptive environment that we live in now these days, look at this, I've got a house. I mean, our closest relative to chimpanzees don't own a house, do they? In most cases, anyway. So it's thought that this is likely to increase our lifespan. And when you think back to hunter-gatherer societies, they tended to not live as long. So women never experienced the menopause. They were already dead. So this menopause could be like a byproduct, if you like, of us living longer. However, this maladaptive hypothesis is contradicted when you look at modern day hunter-gatherer societies. They do exist. Um, the San um, people of Southeast Africa um, have been studied and show that women do go through the menopause there. So this maladaptive hypothesis is a bit patchy. So what about the adaptive one? Now this is all to do with something called the grandmother hypothesis. And that basically speaks for itself really. So instead of carrying on to reproduce and produce your offspring in your old age, instead you become a grandmother and help bring up your children. And through that, just how we were talking about kin selection in homosexuality, you're indirectly increasing the chance of spreading your genes into further generations. The chances of having a successful birth later in life, you know, offspring that will reach maturity, go on to reproduce, that chance significantly decreases. I mean, for a start, the mother may not be alive by the time your child reaches maturity, if she's that old. As you might imagine, there's quite a few risks to both mother and child when this happens. Offspring, very young, quite vulnerable. Mother, very old, quite vulnerable. So the chances of successful births are significantly reduced. And also, on top of this, earlier daughters from that mother may be starting to reproduce themselves, making this whole family extremely complicated and even reducing the chances of later offspring to um, survive even more. So to test this whole hi um, grandmother hypothesis, we wanted to test the reproductive success of helpful grandmothers compared to selfish grandmothers, let's say. So, helpful grandmothers are ones which stop reproducing themselves and devote their time to um, raising, um, help raise their grandchildren. Um, selfish grandmothers are ones which carry on reproducing themselves in their older age. 
And this was done in a study in Gambia, and it was quite successful. They concluded that non-reproductively active grandmothers, so the helpful grandmothers, significantly increased the nutritional status and the survival of the offspring, quite significantly. And the results of this study also suggest that the bodies of women are adapted to um, cope with low oestrogen levels later in life. So oestrogen, of course, is a hormone involved in the menstrual cycle. I did a revision video actually on it, way back in A-level. How interesting. Um, so that means, this could suggest that all these hormone replacement therapy things that are out there may actually um, create conditions in the body which women are not designed to cope with. In fact, there's even been studies that these hormone replacement therapies can increase the risk of breast cancer. Well, I'm afraid, I mean, the time had to come eventually, didn't it? That's all I've got for you today, guys, and I've got to say, thank you to everyone who's um, watched these videos, given me fantastic feedback. Obviously, they've really helped me and my revision loads as well. In fact, yeah, I don't think I'd be, feel as confident with my exams as I am now than if I didn't do these videos. So thank you very much, but also thank you very much for your comments. It's given me a lot of motivation to do them as well. But once again, if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me because I probably am somewhere. So but thank you much for all your time. I'll be back soon. Chill bit, folks. Oh, but before I go, um, I'm going to leave you with a great highlight of the series. Well, it's quite high when you're laying on the floor, isn't it?